Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Zainab Olarpo I am, and I am the host of this Women's Leadership Series. And this is our first interview, inshallah. And my guest is the incredible, I like to call her that, Hajia Saidia Aliyu. Um, she is the CEO and MD of Urban Shelter Limited which is a Nigerian company and she's, I mean, they're doing such an awesome job. They're one of the largest real estate firms in Nigeria and Africa. And the reason why I'm having this conversation with her is because I have been fascinated with women in leadership for quite a while. And I love to see what's behind the scenes because I see mostly that's what mostly everyone sees is the highlight reels of what's going on. But I'd like to see what it looks like on the other side of success. What's going on behind the scenes? And this, I'm sure you will benefit from. And Hajar Saidia is, I mean, we wanted to set this up for a while, but alhamdulillah that it has happened now. So I'm going to allow her to just tell us a bit about her background and this position. And then we'll kick it off from there. So, bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar alaykum as Zainab and everybody that's um, watching this or that will later watch this. It's a real privilege for me to be here and I really appreciate it. Hajar Zainab has been really patient, I think, for something that we've been kind of on and off for the last year where I said to her, unfortunately, I can't do this at this moment. And she's kind of patiently kind of waited for the another year, basically, until this year to hold this. So I really appreciate that. And may Allah bless her kindness and her, and her sabr, alhamdulillah. Uh, my name is Saidiya Aliyu, as, uh, as Hajar Zainab has has said, I am a wife, a daughter. I, I, I struggle with the word leader, but suddenly I work at Urban Shelter and I'm privileged enough to lead a group of an amazingly talented management team and staff as well. And I have a great board that uh, that supports. And, and like Hajar Zainab mentioned, uh, the company is a real estate firm. We are 30 years now in business. It's a family run operation, which comes with its own really interesting and challenging dynamics. But certainly we don't run away from a challenge. So I look forward to kind of talking about that a bit more, I'm sure, as the interview progresses. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for, for honoring this invitation. Yeah. And it, it's quite interesting that you said, oh, I struggle with, I mean, the word being a leader. And this is something that I've actually seen happen a lot especially with women there's just something about us that makes us feel like I don't know whether it's the culture or, or, or what it is it's as if there's something about leadership and women as if it that does not click but that to me is is something that yes probably will get to the root of it now for instance so I mean, you said you work at Urban Shelter. Okay, you started from the bottom and you basically walked your way to the top. So there's this thing again that goes around, you know, it's like women, you know, when they get in and when whatever industry they're in and they get higher up, you know, this career ladder, she's more exposed to, you know, all sorts. And as Muslims, I mean, you understand what I'm saying. And most of the women that will be listening to will also understand that there's a lot of intermingling with sexes. Mm -hmm. There is more responsibilities that you're taking on apart from the home front, then more time commitments, and this will affect the dean. So what has been your own experience with this? That's a really interesting question. You went right in there. Um, no soft questions to begin with. Um, I, I love that question and I I'll explain how how Dean has, I think, become actually really central to business for me. Mine's the other way. Growing up, I think, you know, you put Allah, you put your Dean in, Ya yeah, Allah, let me win this, you know, class three exam so that my parents can get me a gift. And then inshallah, Ya yeah, Allah, class six, let me get into year seven from one because I'll be a big girl then. And then, yeah, Allah, gosh, I hope boarding school is easy. Let me get through GCSEs. Yeah, Allah, let me get through A-levels. I just need the three Bs to get into the right university. So I think, and then once you get through universities, yeah, Allah, give me a good spouse. Yeah, Allah, give me a good husband, inshallah. And then it's, oh, yeah, Allah, please let me have a child. And then, inshallah, it's, oh, let me have a second and a third and a fourth. And, oh, may they be the coolness of our eyes. So I think for the last, for, for decades for me, I've centered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a very personal level, on very personal goals and achievements. Interesting, it's over the last decade, transiting into this leadership position that's actually made me be able to combine Allah, faith, deen, 
and business. So now it's a case of I put him ahead of my challenges. Yeah, Allah, I'm struggling with this particular project and I need you to intervene. I need this investor to come up with X amount so that I can deliver Y. And I put that there. I'm having a challenge, whether it's legal, whether it's new competition in the, in, in the market. So now actually I've really centered my dean around how it can positively impact how I lead and importantly also how the business can be more successful. So for me, it hasn't let go of Dean in any way. I think rather what I've done is to incorporate it. Interestingly, what I've struggled with is my first child, my second, third, fourth. That's the point because you're struggling so much with your new emotions rushing through you. You're struggling through being a new mother. You're struggling through nursing, feeding. You're struggling through mountains of, of diaper. So it's not so much you're not attached to the Dean of Allah SWT, but the physical time it takes for you to make the prayers, the dhikr, the dua is simply not there. And alhamdulillah, thank goodness the Prophet Sallallahu said, your mother, your mother, your mother. So I guess that's taken care of. So for me, like I said, it's actually the other way. I think it's only because I really got deep into my career, higher progressions in my career, that Allah Subhanahu wa really came central into how I see deen impacting success. And so it's not, you know, so women should not, I think, shy away from ambition because they feel it will somehow negate that spiritual side of them. Um, as regards things like mingling with men or so on and so forth, it, my history is I started boarding school quite early at 10 and I started in the UK in a, a village called Lavent. My sister and I were the only two Muslim children there. And I still say that if I probably hadn't gone in that situation, I probably would not have been a hijab sister. So again, so, you know, for a block of 13, 14, 15 years, we only spent time kind of on holidays here back in Nigeria. And yet I have turned into the person I am, thanks to the will of Allah. So a lot of things are the choices you make as an individual. A lot of things are your upbringing, your adhab, and then a lot of things are the prayers of forefathers past that made on behalf of us that they had never meant they are to come. So alhamdulillah for that, yeah. Wow, well, mashallah, that's beautiful. I, I love that. I love the way you've just encapsulated that. Women shouldn't shy from ambition yeah. because of seeing that one spirituality yeah. will be affected. Mm -hmm. And I love that thing about prayer fathers and all that, because it all comes back to even our role as women. Being a leader is not just being a leader on the outside. It's also being in your home. So if you hold on to that dua for yourself, I love what you said about that. And then even for your own offspring, Absolutely. Then it's basically taking care of what could be, could have been Absolutely. an issue. MashaAllah. That's awesome. Yeah, alhamdulillah. I'm curious about something. Sure. Would you say that you your success as a CEO is your source of happiness? It is one source of happiness. It is not um, the only source of happiness. Uh, it, it's, it gives me great satisfaction. It gives me great joy. It also gives me great challenge and great stress. It's something that I hold dear because I put a lot of time, energy, and effort to it. So I think if I quantify it as one level of, uh, of success, of happiness, of contentment, definitely. I wouldn't use the word source because I think that's really giving it a lot more strength. So for that, I, I, there's a family behind me that humbles me every day because while I have this huge job, I still come home to mommy, I need the bathroom. Um, so so my, my kids, my husband, and Alhamdulillah, at the end of the day, every source of joy like comes from Allah. But what he's done is obviously given me different routes and channels to have sources of happiness, sources of success, one of them being this position I'm in, one of them being the business that I lead, one of them is being able to really, I mean, literally impact Nigerians by providing real estate. We build houses, we build shops, we build markets, we build um, sites and services. And there's no greater joy, I think, than seeing families in particular moving into their homes. It feels, you know, people that perhaps have struggled for years and years to try and get on the property ladder. And you're part of that family, you know, kind of going through levels. Uh, a quick story, by the way, we, we see people that, you know, will say, I've bought from your first project in Kobo and, and now I'm buying, for instance, from Life Camp. So it tells me over a stretch of 15 years, they've moved from a single family to a family with two kids. So they've had to look for something bigger, family with four kids, and then also their income and resources are kind of growing. And so they've moved location as well. And I think so that gives me great joy, definitely. That's beautiful. You know, the reason why I ask that question is because there's this misunderstanding that our happiness comes from the things that we're able to do. 
maybe the positions we hold mm -hmm. or things we have and all that. And I love that you're saying that this is not the situation because there's a lot of, you know, sometimes ambition is driven, you know, ambition can be driven by anything, mm -hmm. but then when it's driven by, okay, when I get to that position, I'll be happy. Or when I get this, I'll be happy. When, so you were saying, I mean, you've experienced, alhamdulillah, this trajectory of success mm -hmm. and you've seen that it's not like you your happiness is tied to the success that you you get from Allah so thank you very much for for sharing that um there's another question in fact this was a question that I had on my list right and then somebody actually said it it's like it's a man's world right <laughs> our industry is male we're really male dominated as well so how have you navigated this right <laughs> So I think this is an interesting one. And again, I might be an anomaly or perhaps other sisters have, have experienced this. So my background is finance and economics. Um, and I do a lot of panels and sessions and interviews. And, and whenever they're introducing a panel of say five people, the first person will say, my name is so-and-so and I'm barrister, sorry, I'm, I'm engineer such and such. The next person will say, I'm town planner, A, B, and C. Next person will say, I'm architect so-and-so. And it comes to me and I'm always just idea Ali with an NYSC initial, that's it. I don't have, I'm not an engineer and so on and so forth and I'm not an architect, but because I grew up in a family of real estate, a bit like if you grew up in a family of farming, you would know how to do agriculture. So I grew up in a family of real estate, so it comes kind of in my blood. So keeping that in mind, I actually find my struggle is more with people realizing that simply because I haven't studied architecture for five years, engineering for four years, does not mean I have the capacity to work in this arena. The second thing also is I think, I think the hijab puts people off. So I'm neither this category of woman or, or I'm of course not a man, but I'm also not, not, not a woman, not in a bad way, but I'm this third sex that is quite neutral. So you take me at face value and you just say, see, what does she have to offer? And I like to think, Alhamdulillah, within a three, four, five minute meeting that I can prove myself if I need to, that I'm actually quite capable. And then what you have to do, of course, is kind of lead by example. The first door may be closed. What I mean by that is you might go looking for opportunity. People take one look at you. You're a woman. You're from the north. You're in hijab, and they close the door. Keep knocking. I'm a persistent person. It's not that I don't take no for an answer, but I I believe that the kind of nothing worth having is going to be easy. Um, I don't necessarily say you must struggle for everything, or everything has to be a challenge. But I do believe in kind of hard work. I believe in an ethic of putting in your best foot forward. I believe in striving a lot, and inshallah, with a lot of dua, you kind of get there. So I can't say that I've, I've faced huge misogyny. In the industry, of course, that doesn't uh, that doesn't mean it's not happening because it really does happen, whether we like it or not. Women are given less opportunities in all kinds of business, in funding and finance, in career growth and promotions, and so on and so forth. So it's a real challenge, definitely. Mm. I so think as leaders. Sorry, I was going to start interrupt you. I'd say as, as female leaders, we have to do better about being intentional, about getting more women into these spaces. And I think our men, male, male counterparts, allies, also, they really should be allies. They also have to be intentional about getting more women um, in whether it's real estate, whether it's construction, or whether it's any industries that, are, that women are underrepresented. What this means is, for instance, if you call for interviews or CVs and you find that there are 20 CVs and all of them are for men, insist with your head of HR that at least 30, 40, 50% of them must come from women. Things along those lines, it's important. It won't happen automatically. You have to be very intentional about doing these things. And then we begin to see the change that kind of we want to see and change that hopefully narrative, I guess. Mm, yeah. So that, what you said about being intentional, mm. would you, have you experienced situations where you actually have you know, people deliberately like hinder your progress, get in your way. Um, I, I almost a, don't want yeah. to say just because you're a woman. Yeah. So I don't know if you want the story, but it, it happened with it's women, fine, please go women, on, women on women as opposed to men. Um, I've had amazing mentors in my life and all of them have been men. And, and, and at each stage that you have either pushed me. So I have a 20, 21 year a career now and during my first job my my first uh, mentor was a gentleman my second was a was a gentleman and at each point they would say look you can really handle this this project handle it in fact you can do it yourself 
and on the back of that, I was able to be put in through for like a, a, an advanced promotion. And four ladies in the office um, really actually put up a petition to say, why would Saija be uh, promoted ahead of us? Now, the story simply should be, why are we not promoted? Saidia or not Saidia, not being there had nothing. It wasn't that I took anybody's spot and there's enough room for everybody to grow. For instance, the real estate market, whenever there's new competition, there are 200 million Nigerians, there's X amount of uh, deficit in the housing industry, there's enough room for everybody to play. So in that similar situation as well, it wasn't an either or situation, there was opportunity for everybody to progress. So I find women, we can, we can be, we can be, unsupportive in terms of championing women's growth we look at it as a threat as opposed to trying to carry all the, everybody along and if you can't carry everybody along certainly don't kind of aim to hinder and that was very early on in my career though I think once I got sure footed 10 years into my career so that's over the last decade it became a lot easier to navigate and I imagine that perhaps for a lot of women it's 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 that way that early in their career that there might be a lot of hindrances I have to say that it looks like there is definitely a glass ceiling what I've noticed also happening in the corporate world is a lot of women tend to get called in at the brink of a company collapse. There's a particular term for it, and, and I won't name the companies, but, but you kind of get called in. They, they'll, they'll pick the woman in the senior management team and have that person like as an acting MD when the company is struggling. Amazingly, by the way, nine times out of 10, the women do perform and somehow manage to bring these companies back out of the brink. So it's not something that I hope to face, certainly. Um, so apart from that, I think that that small bump and I call it a small bump because it's I, I quickly put it in that category of I am not in any way hindering somebody else's progress and my sunlight does not block out your sunlight and therefore there really should be no controversy in this it was a surprise like I said but it put me I think quite early on in my career to realize that I shouldn't expect things to go smoothly that there will be challenges there should be questions and I don't mind people asking challenging questions you may or may not like the answer I will give you but I will certainly give you a response to that to that query. So no major hindrance. Uh, so far, so good, inshallah, yeah, Allah, alhamdulillah, apart from that particular one very early on. That is a kind of bombs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, so if you're listening to it, mm -hmm. to this, you, you're most likely to be a woman. Of course, I know some men will be listening to it. Okay. So we need to get thinking. It's quite interesting that that was one of the questions I was going to ask is in, and I would still want you to, to talk about this. You did say that, yeah, you have more men that shown you support, like at the beginning of your, um, your, your journey, but have you specifically found women supportive? I know this is like, might be an isolated incident, but I do know it does happen quite a lot. And there's a question I'm going to ask you. We're going to get to that, inshallah, mm -hmm. that might help us dig into this. So have you found women supportive in certain ways? Even maybe even outside the corporate world, because we know we don't exist in isolation. The family is still there. The society is still there. We have a social world mm -hmm. and all. So let's look at it in that holistic manner in terms of women being supportive. Oh, yeah. So absolutely. And again, I don't know if this will cross over a different question you have. But if we move it into the personal space, I think, for instance, how my my family set up is my inner circle of friends, it, it, that, that whole classic, uh, it, it takes a village to raise the child. And as far as I'm concerned, it takes a village to even raise a family that really best describes me. So I have support from my siblings, my sisters, I have support from my sister-in-laws that that's that's my, my husband's sisters I have sis, my sister support from my sister-in-laws that are married to my own brothers um, mother-in-laws on all sides as well um, my parents my step my late stepmother may Allah you know forgive her and have mercy on her mm -hmm. so uh, across the board I wouldn't be actually very comfortable in the growth and career that I am if it wasn't for the support of the women around me especially in my personal life it's been alhamdulillah you know my, my brother-in-law calls it the birth lottery i was in the birth lottery with this family in terms of that support we are we all have what we call substitute parents uh, with our kids across the board with siblings and i think that's that's been something that's been phenomenal and how we've been able to kind of have this family unity mashallah but also being able to take part of parental duties where needed and where gaps are there and where we've identified it 
So on a personal level, huge support. I think friends as well. I don't have a huge amount of friends. I have a block of friends. And we've grown together for the last 20 years, which is from NYSE. So we've done the whole learning and, and, and losing. We've done the errors. We've done the lack of judgment. We've done the marriages. We've done the births. We've done the loss. And we grew into that space that we're now we're kind of in that mid-generation. You know, we're not quite middle age, although getting there. But we're now in that space where there's a sense of maturity where you're quite comfortable in your own skin. Um, and you're now looking actually to say, how do you mentor the next generation behind you? If not generation, certainly those that are say 10, 15 years behind you. Uh, it's only in the last one or two years that I'm trying to make an effort because I think it, it needs to be a two way street. As much as you're looking for support, I think you also need to put it out there. I, I'm not a na naturally um, extroverted person. I can be quite shy and introverted. I can, it takes me a while to, to come out of my shell. So something I'm putting out in the world right now, inshallah, is that yeah, I need to surround myself with women that I really admire, that are 10 years ahead of where I want to be. And, and by kind of um, not necessarily associating, but trying to interact, trying to engage with them on a professional and maybe a little bit personal level, then I can have the support that it is I desire. So I think it takes two to tangle. It would be fantastic to say there are women supporting you throughout your career. But also, I think we need to make ourselves more visible. And as women, we tend to shrink away from that, whether it's out of kind of natural instinct or whether it's kind of, I don't know, patriarchal society making a shrink back. I, I, I don't know. But it's, it's a thing that, that, that we do. So I'll confess to say I need to do more about putting myself out there to get the kind of support I need. But in terms of my personal space, in terms of building womanhood and, and that sisterhood of friendship, I just get alhamdulillah. I feel really, really happy and privileged about that. It's a really secure space for me. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, you know, going back to that, what happens in that space, sure. you know, in the corporate world where, you know, that kind of incident happens. It's leading me on to, you know, this question about um, the leaders mm -hmm. are looked at, right? Typically, when someone becomes, um, you know, firstly becomes a high achiever, or high performer, the next thing that happens is they are in this space of leadership. I'm so sorry, and I just then, that, but I just missed the last thirty seconds of that. I think your face went frozen. It might be my end. Oh, sorry. Okay. I had I leadership. See. I had leaders. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what I said was that um, we have, you know, you're in that space, that corporate space, and then, you know, you. You're, you're a high achiever, you're a high performer, definitely, you, just as you said, you know, you get, you, you move on into that leadership space. Okay. So what happens, typically tends to happen is people tend to now to look at whoever is, you know, looked at, oh, this person mm -hmm. has moved on. People tend to put you on a pe pedestal, right? And, you know, what this looks like, most people is that this person has everything all together. No. they're superhuman but what I know is we all are human so I'm curious what insecurities you know have you had mm -hmm. you know have you had a point where you actually doubted yourself you know on this journey love this question so I'm single-handedly here to tell you that no everybody has insecurities I don't care who you are you have it <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, I, I would even kind of strive as far as saying that a significant number of us all have that imposter syndrome. I think there's the moments I certainly wake up and I think, what on earth am I doing here? Have I bitten off too much that I can chew? And in terms of history, for instance, I was in middle management when this opportunity came. Our pioneer MD was leaving and chairman and the board said, look, do you think this is a role you can step into as a chief operating officer? And at the time, I'd actually, I actually, I was in so much shock. I said, I just had my baby. And I said, um, I'm so sorry, sir. I'm going to have to think about this. I have a very young family. Went back home and said to my husband, my goodness, this is what's happening in the office. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's happening really suddenly. He looked at me and said, Saidiya, go back to the chairman's office tomorrow and tell him you're going to take it. He said, Saidiya, mashallah, we have prayed for this. I have prayed for this for you and I. Yours is here. Go and take it. Now, what this does is obviously it validates the insecurities you have that you may not be capable of having a second, third person say to you, I have seen this in you. And a lot of times we don't understand our level of skill as well. Well, we, we kind of have a good idea, but then we doubt ourselves. 
And it takes somebody else that's perhaps close to you or that knows your capabilities, personally, profession, to say, my goodness, you actually match this. You have these set of skills or you have the potential to fulfill this role. And therefore, with a bit of handholding, you will actually be the leader that perhaps you, you, you know, you're inshallah destined to be. So that's that kind of kick up the butt that my husband gave me. And the next day I went back in. I did a march. I quietly went back in and I said, I really look forward to this privilege and this opportunity. Um, so that's in terms of insecurity. I think. But what I've been able to do, and I think maybe uh, inshallah, this, this kind of very traditional, I don't want to say archaic view of leaders being at the very top, being superhuman, I think it's slowly eroding, or rather it should slowly erode. I think we're very much human, we're very much flawed, and alhamdulillah, we have to be honest, we, it, 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 there is no single person. I can be very awkward about accepting awards, for instance, when they give you an MD award, because it wasn't this, this one leader, singular cell person that kind of created the success that you now see. It was decades of hard work, hundreds of people, a management team, find a deciding officer myself, but a governing body as well. That's your, that's, that's your board that gets you to where you are. And I like to share that definitely with everybody. My leadership skill, my leadership, sorry, style has always been one of real openness it's been one of hearing diverse voices i believe in listening to people i believe in feedback good or bad because that's the only way we can grow so for me you know um positive sorry uh criticism that's constructive i find that it's very helpful to build me as an individual and as a company as uh, also i think being able to speak to each other respectfully and either agree or disagree is also absolutely vital what we're doing for instance in urban shelter now is we're going beyond senior management to look at heads of departments and and, and, and project managers to put them in leadership positions to have them um you know handle projects individually or programs individually or set up committees and so on and so forth so we're breaking down i think this myth of a singular leader yes there is ultimately one decision maker but I think how we come at that decision needs a number of voices so that we are able to make the best decision. Um, so insecurities are there, absolutely. I think putting leaders on a pedestal is a bit of a dangerous, um, and we've seen that actually, especially in politics and, and in the corporate bodies where you have everything pinned to one person being the savior complex and it doesn't work out. So I think a flatter structure definitely is, is more helpful. And that's what we advocate at Open Shelter. And Alhamdulillah, I have to say, it's been working out for us relatively well, mashallah. Yeah. That, that that's awesome yeah. and yeah. and i can attest to this in the sense that when i you know we reached out to you to congratulate you on um being nominated for nigeria's most oh. respected ceo award that was exactly what you said about it just okay. wasn't me. it wasn't just me yeah. it's the whole crew the yeah. you know the staff the management and all that and i really love that um that humility yeah. and you know sharing that and being really very open yeah. open about that it's 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 really it's really beautiful um you know you you've you said okay yeah you are definitely there has to be one overall person in charge and all that but then the culture still is that when people are at the top there's still there's still this thing about wanting to you know go yes 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 you know and I mean, for people, you know, at the lower, lower rung, mm -hmm. there's this thing about what oh, this person is at the top, is in charge. So there's, I can't tell them everything, mm -hmm. etc., and all that. And um, so sometimes you find, I mean, this has happened in the corporate world that stuff are going on in a, in a, in, in a company. And then the last person to hear about it is the person at the top. And by then a lot of things have just gone haywire and all that. So for this, I mean, you are at the top, right? And you are basically 100% responsible for whatever happens in your organization. And that, that is it. There is, even if you were to make a wrong decision and you said, go execute it and it's done and all that, whatever happens, you have to deal with the consequences and all that. So have you found that a kind of, um, you know, is it lonely? Does it make you like lonely up there? Yeah. Uh, yes, in a singular word, but I th I don't think that really fully covers it. it. It is lonely at the top. I don't think there's any any way to, to to deny that because, like you mentioned, at the end of the day, you are having to pull the plug on any decision, 
and right or wrong, uh, my general kind of ethos as well is to just never be indecisive, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, make a decision. If it's a disaster of a, of a, of a, of a decision that you've made, it'll hopefully be just a tiny full stop in an entire book that is your life or that it's your history or that it's the company. But it's important to make that decision. It can be very isolating at the top. And by the way, I agree, I've read quite a few um, bits of research and, and on um, this issue of the last person to know is the person at the top. I, it would be incredibly arrogant for me to say, I know everything that's happening in the company at every time that's happening in the company. And there are times, by the way, I'm happy to not know. I don't want to necessarily know if you're having um, a breakdown in your relationship and it, you know, it leads me to you and I crying in my office. I cry easily. So whenever people come with personal problems, I, believe, I actually say, please don't come. I don't need to break down in the office with you. So, th so things like that. So there are things I'm quite happy to not know. There are things that, again, depending on your leadership style, that you have an open door policy um, to say, please come in. And then when you lead in a way that means there are no negative ramifications to bringing people bringing information or that's i don't want to use the word whistleblowing but that are people that are bringing information that are actually important for you to know that's also important what niger what all of us don't like is for you to bring a piece of information and there's inaction if i do the second and third time there's inaction it tells me that actually my voice isn't being listened to i am not valued i'm not a contributing member of this entire company and so then people stop talking to you i think being a woman also that's that aspect that i think we have to lean into i think alhamdulillah we are natural communicators i think people are drawn to come and want to speak to us then if for instance that it was um, a male and i have to remind one or two people sometimes that we are in an office setting and there's certain things that we cannot necessarily get into uh, so, so the both are, are true. I, I absolutely agree with you, Hajar Zainab. It can be isolating at the top because you are having to make decisions. At the end of the day, you are the one that pulls the plug, regardless of the level of consultation, carrying along stakeholders that you do. In this situation, I would really advise people to, alhamdulillah, really consult with Allah. If you have a family, also dig deep with your family because, alhamdulillah, family is humbling. You're not a leader with your family. You're part of the squad. You're part of the football team. You know, you, you know if, if there's a mess in the toilet, you're in there. If there's cooking to do, you're in there. If, there's, if you're playing the door game, you're in there. So it's a great equalizer that makes you realize that, fine, you're making these major decisions in the corporate world. But at home, there is that structure that just gives you this amazing, mashallah, warm hug. Um, and, and, and like I said, make Allah central to those decisions. When you do, then it feels as though you haven't kind of single-handedly done this You've done it with the help. You've done it with a gentle push. You've done it with a level of confidence that says, Alhamdulillah, I've made this decision, good or bad, it is made. And Ya Allah, if it is good, make it happen. If it's not, please just let me avoid it. So when you approach that and it, and it doesn't work out how you want, because you made that, uh, you've made peace with the fact that that wasn't meant to be for you as a company or you as an individual. And it's really helpful way in terms of guidance. Um, and yeah, so that, that's, that's how I treat the two. So on, on the voices and hearing about issues in the company, I actually filter, and I do agree with you, you don't hear everything, but I also want to counter that you don't necessarily want to hear everything. It sometimes allows you to give a great grace of five, ten percent to not have to take action on people that pay, maybe giving kind of, you know, you, we're going through very difficult challenges, for instance, as a macroeconomy now, you don't want to necessarily fire somebody unless there's absolute gross negligence. So don't necessarily hear everything filter it you don't want to hear the gossip and chit chatter you want to focus on big issues big problems big opportunities as well inshallah yeah, that, that that's beautiful um you know what you said about you know women being naturally sorry i muted <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's fine <laughs> okay how's your side yeah um you know what you said about the the you know women are know they would really get a listening here and all that it's that thing about we women being natural nurturers and carers it makes us want to save the world though I know you've said it earlier I mean when you answered earlier about okay yeah I don't necessarily need to hear everything and all that but then there's that thing about us being women where we just naturally want to resolve things want things to be taken care of and because of this we tend sometimes to take on more responsibilities than we ought to and this is even outside that career or the corporate world also you know whatever sphere all the spheres we're operating and this is something I call the superwoman syndrome yeah. uh, so what's your take on that have you have you struggled with that 
That's a really good point. I've seen a lot of women struggle to try and make everybody and everything and anyone happy. Um, but the thing is, and, and when we go back to that scenario that, you know, your body has rights over you, your family has rights over you, your dean has rights over you, then you need to then have to kind of step back and say, how far can I take this? Because in trying to become a superwoman, if you're not careful, you end up with a stroke at 40 or 50. It's a very dangerous thing to your health, your mental, your mental, your mental well-being, your physical well-being. And it's something that we really need to kind of step back from. We put women on that pedal. The pedestal you mentioned earlier, by the way, women, I think, are put on that pedestal a lot. Um, I became an accidental firstborn, so it wasn't a role I was born and raised to handle, so that was a shock to me. But certainly, I have a huge sense of duty and responsibility. So, for instance, in my personal life, when you talk about being a superwoman, I don't look at it as being a superwoman, but I certainly model myself on what kind of a big sister do, would, what do I wish I still have. And so it is making myself, my, myself, my energy, my time available to siblings. It's giving them that space to have somebody safe to be around or to go to if there's something they need that's on a personal level on a professional level we've learned as a company um, to say no and that's a very difficult small word but it's a very important word to be able to say no and people struggle i've had people say don't you guys want money but if i cannot deliver a project as it should be delivered i really should not enter into something Nothing. I, I, I am wary about starting things that I know I don't have a clear exit on when it comes to projects and construction and delivering real estate. And people always are surprised that, well, why can't you take ABC on? Why can't you go to Orary? Why can't you go to Sokoto? Why can't you go to X? And you want to say to them, because if I do that, then we are going to compromise on our quality, on our projects, on our integrity and credibility when we say we will do the right project for the right environment. And so you have to learn to say no and draw back. Uh, personally, I've also learned to say no and mashallah, bless my husband for this because he taught me very early when we got married that until you say no, the requests will keep coming. The request on your time, your energy, your person, your resources, all of it. And it's, it's something it's taken me a while to get to. So 30 year old me, I was still saying yes everything you needed me to bake a cake i'm there you need me to be pick up your kids from school i'm there you need me to be at a function in kenya i'll be there so it's something that alhamdulillah would age with grace at the age i am now it rolls off my tongue quite easily my poor children all they hear is no 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 i still have that sense of duty responsibility both in terms of my commitment professionally um and that leadership person and towards my colleagues i also still have it to my siblings as well and to my parents alhamdulillah i think that's also important and alhamdulillah of course all the wonderful amazing islamic benefits of doing that but we need to learn to say no as women it's a very empowering word a word i'm teaching my 20 year old daughter to say no is a word it's a sentence it's a full stop paragraph it's an entire book no there need be no explanation no i cannot do it because no 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 just no you can be polite and say thank you after the no, but it's something I'm trying to preach. That is powerful. Yeah. yeah. This is so what, hard, but, yeah, but you know what you said, basically being able to get to that point where no is a complete statement, unapologetic yeah. about is basically that line that a lot of people struggle to cross. Sure. I know I'm still, I haven't, I can't, I can maybe haven't gotten there quite yet as much as I'd want, but I can resonate with that. And I know many women will be able to sure. resonate with this, but the reality is that why I said it's powerful is that if we do not cross that, we will struggle. Exactly. We will struggle. Exactly. Because something will, will drop, something will fall, yes. something will be compromised. And that yes. gets very dangerous. Either yourself as a person, your dean, your marriage, your yes. kids, your parents, your work, your career, your learning, something then, because you just cannot juggle all of it all at once, all the time. So there's a very much a pull push factor to these things. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's, 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 that's awesome. Okay, so what has been the most difficult challenge you faced? Um, that's a tough one. We, uh, on a professional level, I think it was definitely this 
feeling of, am I able to do this? So when you mentioned insecurities earlier, the imposter syndrome, trying to push away from that and trying to actually lead the example, lead by example to say that I am capable. I have earned this seat to be here and to lead and to be a voice that is going to give vision uh, to be able to say this is the, the, the objectives of the company and to actually match our, our projects, our actions towards those objectives and the goals and the missions to execute them. So I think at the early days, that was a real huge challenge for me. Um, I, it, I had to come out of my shell to do that. Like I said, I'm not a natural kind of leader. I, I, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole school of thought of whether there are natural born leaders or whether leaders are nurtured. In my case, it was something that I was very much made to become a leader. I was nurtured to become a leader. I was created into it. I wasn't something that I was born into. Um, and so I think those days there, were, there was definitely struggle. Um, but again, you need to push yourself out there, out of that comfort zone to be able to actually achieve something. Staying in the huddle of your room, mashallah, even if it's on your prayer mat, you still need to put that action. So, you know, the prophet says, tie the rope and pray. Try that, cam you know, tie the camel to, you know, but, and then pray. So you've got to take action and then pray as well. The two go hand in hand together. I think on a personal level, we've had an interesting dynamic as a family. So we've lost Alhamdulillah. And I say that Alhamdulillah, because inshallah, Allah will build that bait Alhamd for us, inshallah. But we've lost five siblings. So we've lost five siblings in my family. We've lost five siblings and, and our mother. And, and this was all the way, you know, between 2005 and, and just last year. And it has been, obviously, I can use words like devastating, heartbreaking. But it has also been a way for us to reestablish ourselves as a family. It's been a way for us to not take things for granted. It's been for us to, again, actually be, alhamdulillah, give grace, give praise and thanks to Allah in every single way. He is the creator. We've always said, we look at ourselves and say we are on loan. You know, Allah loves things that are beautiful. He's taking something that is so beautiful from this world back to him. He said, you know, one of my aunts said to me when my brother died, um, uh, he doesn't want this amazing servant if he's to suffer in this world he's calling him back and I love it and another one a cousin said to me was look mashallah the person who does you know who's the most amazing Muslim ever who did Allah love the most and of course I said I said well and she said to me well who has faced the most challenge and the most trial and and I said Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. and she goes in that case inshallah Allah knows of the Alu family and I can't tell you how amazingly warm that makes me feel. So I think the, 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 the challenge of loss, if, if you have to call it a challenge, because it's not that it has impacted us negatively, subhanAllah, no, 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 no. In, in every way, it has made us realize what we have. It has made us realize we would not change a thing in everything that has happened, in every loss that has happened. We still say, alhamdulillah, even the ways that have happened, we're so really grateful for it. For, for that as well and we give grace and thanks in every way it's been a challenge simply because of course you want to see them at natural milestones weddings birthdays graduations uh, my brother because i worked with him day to day it felt it did feel for a good year or so as though my left um my right leg my eye my hearing was kind of just not working not fully functioning but you push away from that and alhamdulillah you realize that you have something really amazing in that you're being here, in that you're honoring them, praying for them, alhamdulillah, inshallah, generation. We talked about prayers of those gone past. We're talking about now the ones to come to the feet, the ones that, that are ahead as well. So that's been, I think that, that's been the challenge, I think. May Allah reunite you all in that. Amen. Faith that's my prayer. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Well, alhamdulillah. you know, I was, I was going to ask about resilience, <laughs> but what you've said, basically, I think it answers the question I hadn't yeah. asked. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what's your pillar of resilience? No, sorry, it's okay. Yeah. You know, from what I hear you yeah. say, I mean, it's really about holding on to Allah. Yeah, we, we, hold, we, we hold on to Allah. We hold on to each other. We hold on to the rope. Um, we, are, we touch base a lot. We're lucky, mashallah, to all be in, in Abuja as siblings as well. So our kids are constantly interacting. It's really interesting as well. And, and our kids look like different siblings. So unless you really know what's, you might actually not know whose kids are whose. That's another interesting kind of just wonder of Allah as well. So that's really interesting. Um, they spend weekends across. 
Um, but resilience, I think, has to come with the natural experiences you have gone through in life. And without facing these challenges, there is no resilience. So everything that has happened to you has been channeling you into something. You know, there isn't a moment I wake up and, and, and Alhamdulillah, please, not, not in any arrogant way. I wake up every moment and I'm thinking, yeah, Allah, you have built me for greatness. You have built me for this day, for this moment. When a challenge comes forth, I'm thinking, inshallah, that so long as I'm alive, that sun will rise again tomorrow. Progress will come. Another day will come, another week, another month, another year. And if I have died, then, well, it doesn't really matter. But I'm away from that challenge and Allah will find a way. When you make prayer, it's really something. At, at the minimum it does when you pray is it gives you comfort. The best it does is it gives you the result that you're looking for. The medium it does is it doesn't give you the result you're looking for, but then you realize that because you didn't get it, it meant that it wasn't something good for you in the first place. So then why would you want something that's bad for you? So you've got to put central faith to, is central to resilience. So that's on a very spiritual level. Now, resilience on a family level, of course, is just anybody that's raising a family, you know the grit and the guts you need to dig in day to day because the days are so very long. You wake up and your child is 10 and your child is 15 and your child is 20. So that goes really quickly. But between that seven in the morning or if they crash in your room at 4 a.m. and they don't sleep till 8 p.m., though that, that you feel every minute and every second of that. So I think family resilience is something that's in built in you from the day you pick up that baby and you bring them home. You are in the trenches with your husband. You know, you're changing the diapers, you're doing the feeding, you're doing homework as they get older, you're doing projects, you're turning up a school recital. You're watching your daughter who says she wants to be a ballerina. I'm thinking, okay, let's stretch this to 12 years old and see how we do if we can get a hijab on by then. But anyway, so, 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 there, so there's resilience in that, I think, day to day. And then resilience in office is an interesting one. That's in the corporate world. Now that, that's built again because of challenges. And, and it's interesting that a skill you need resilience is built because of going through very difficult challenges, experiences and issues. And, and, and resilience comes with being a 30 year old company. How do you continue to innovate? How do you continue to provide something that's new? How do you begin to open up new sites? Diversification in terms of the kind of projects you do in terms of ge geographical locations, in terms of even helping clients on financial tools so they can acquire homes. You've got, you have to be resilient because every couple of years, I'm seeing billboards are all over Abuja. It's really interesting. There are real estate billboards all over Abuja. So every time I drive down, my kids now know they're in age now, they know the work I do. So every time I go somewhere with them, they're like, mommy, that's another company. I'm like, thank you. I don't need to, I don't need to see it. Let's keep, let's keep driving. So, so you have to be resilient to think, you know, well, what's the competition doing? Okay, I'm interested, but I'm not kind of nitpicking at them because we're running our race. Urban Shelter is running a race with itself. I'm not looking at how company X is doing and I need to match it. I'm looking at what did we do two years ago and how do I make that better? Now, when you make that your thing, you, you're really kind of, far-sighted you're looking ahead of those goals and you're trying to be say resilient in being in that market we're living in a time in this and it's not just nigeria it's globally it's everything from covid is the financial markets is the recent ukraine war we didn't nobody realized ukraine was so important until grains and yeah. energy and so many things it turns out it's actually a really major supplier for a number of things that that we use here and suddenly, you know, you're in a macro economy, like I said, not just Nigeria, but globally, where you have huge rising energy costs, inflation roaring, and in forex in our case. As Nigerians, we are born resilient. You are, you are forced to be resilient. You're, you're forced to be quite, I think, um, thinking outside the box about how to manage these difficult situations. And so that also translates, again, challenges that force you to be innovative, that force you to be, have resilience. So that's on the macro economy. So, you know, so that's, I think, what I call the, the three silos, you know, resilience in faith. And we've had to do that through loss, mashallah, resilience in, in family, personal level, and resilience, I think, in the corporate world, because um, I think all three factors, well, for me anyway, I, I look at my life in those kind of three buckets, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. You know, the way that I've always seen this, well, not always, but recently with what I've, you know, studied about states of mind yeah. and all that is yeah. that resilience is in it. It's like we, it's, it's enough. Fight to or flight. Us. Mm -hmm. It's like there. Fight or flight thing. Mm -hmm. However, so it's like, it's like, we need to have a certainty that we are resilient. Mm -hmm. However, we do not, we are not able to explore the resilience if there are no challenges. Yeah, that's So it's brilliant. the challenges that actually help you bring see, it out, that's bring really it out and you actually see. Because we not, if, sometimes we forget that yeah. whatever comes, we are built to push yep. Yep. through. 
And I love what you said about greatness. This is something that every woman needs to remind herself because about uh, yeah I, I use the example of a pencil you know um the, the humble biro big it has a purpose it's meant to write it's meant to do things you are the most complicated human being you're the sorry you're the most complicated creation of Allah wa ta'ala. you are built for greatness you have purpose and I think we should never forget that honestly alhamdulillah yeah 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 that's that's I'm, I'm really loving this conversation I don't want it to end <laughs> Um, okay, so, so, you know, this is, okay, so this is also related to, you know, states of mind as well. Yeah. So there's been um, a lot of research, you know, being, you know, related to states of mind and highlighting self-compassion mm-hmm. as something um, really valuable, you know, as an internal state to the well-being of everybody and even especially leaders because of the kind of responsibilities they carry so have you how have you have you personally leaned into this you know um you know context of things i i have just and i have to confess i have not so you're going to have to teach me and send me far more material i i, I haven't um i think in in the women's sphere we hear a lot about self-care um, but in leadership, and that's regardless of the sex, we don't hear enough about self-compassion. But it is so very necessary. So my honest answer is it's something that I haven't explored. I think that I use words like be kind to yourself with my children because they might come back with a bad grade. They might come back like a child, another child has upset them or called them names uh, or they're just struggling. You know, you know, we, my, my kids and I allow them to have one day off a term from school or from Islamia when they just having they don't feel like they don't feel great about themselves so and I say to them but be kind to yourself so it's the word that I use myself say be kind to myself but I love the term self-compassion I don't I haven't leaned into it in all honesty but it's something I clearly need to do far more of and I wonder actually how to start even going about it in fairness okay yeah thank you so much for I love I love the way you have been really honest about this and I, I I I can see that that is that's part of the power of being a leader is really open and seeing like the metrics what is it that i'm measuring and where am i at at whatever it is so thank you so much for that and i'd really love to i I will definitely you know support you there inshallah um so oh my god i really don't want this to end (laughs) so what if you were to um what, what what three books you could tell us one oh, maybe but what three yeah. books would you think has to be yeah i'm saying i'm missing i'm miss, i think it's my internet again you're frozen oh dear not just on the bookshelf okay. of every female leader a lot of wisdom from i'm not sure about me? i'm not oh, sorry like you're right it's you, a glitch you, you, yes we did it was from my end again so you were you okay. asking about one or two three books that that every person everyone yeah. should read should read or on their bookshelves yeah yeah i'm not sure if i well i am that's a very strong term because i'm not sure that every they really have to but but I, i'm mm-hmm. and embarrassingly i i have stopped reading the way i used to really read mm-hmm. actually, so maybe when we're talking about challenges that's the one thing that also has dropped down um but interestingly i'm going on a journey the last two three years or so where i'm really focusing on autobiographies in particular, I'm focusing on the autobiographies of women. Remember how I said to you about when you mentioned that the question of support, and I said, well, I need to do more about looking for support, especially women that are 10 years ahead of me. Yeah, so I've been looking at women that I admire globally. So been, and, and what I did is to start looking at their journey. How did they start, start off from family dynamics, how, you know, where they were born, what made into play about their education and then their early career and then marriages and family and again, more growth, whether in politics or the corporate world globally, by the way. So, so on those terms, I'm, sorry, fortunately or unfortunately, I have three books, all women, two are completely autobiographical. One is kind of semi-autobiographical and we've been using that word again. So it's the Lean In book, Cheryl Sandberg, the Lean In book. I, I really advocate for that. I read it a few, you know, when it first came out and at the time it was really trying to balance again more of family and I was doing these things already but then I realized that I actually could do it more which is really leveraging on the people I had around me to help support where I wanted to to go what I wanted to do and how I wanted to 
be within a family structure as well as lead within uh, an organizational structure. So I would fully, fully recommend uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. Michael, uh, sorry, not Michael, Michelle Obama's book as well, Becoming, because reading it was absolutely, it, I mean, one, she potentially could have been the president as far as I'm concerned. So that's, that's the first off. And the one I'm currently reading is this lovely lady, it's called My Life in Full, and it's this lady. Um, I, I forget her last name, Indra. It, her first name is India, Indra. I forget her last name, but she was Pepsi. I think it was PepsiCo. She, she was what? She was the former CEO at Pepsi. Amazing upbringing in India and then moved to the US to study, I think, a master's degree. I ended up getting married there and working there and just progressing really far in the corporate world and becoming one of a very handful of women um, to be in a, you know, to head to be a CEO in the top 500 companies. So I'm looking at autobiographies and I'd advise women as well to do autobiographies because I, I went through a rut of reading. I used to read a lot of these management books, how to be this and how to be that. And, and I would start them and not finish them because halfway through, I just thought, gosh, I can't, you know, this won't work in Nigeria. And how I then got back into it is because of the autobiographies, because then I saw far more symmetry in my life and points of, I think, interest that I could pick up and points of um, potential application that I could also put in my life. And, I, and so I, I, I fully advocate for autobiographical books, definitely. I might stick in the story of Khadija Radiallahu and her as well, because I think she's an Thank absolutely you. Thank you so amazing much. I made woman. notes. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you made notes. Yes, yes, she is. Yeah. No, definitely yeah. she is. And the interesting thing is that I have a different spin on the way I look at her life. Ah. A lot of focus is on business. I mean, she was a business mogul, yeah. she was wealthy, yeah. et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But the way I see her is that her greatest wealth yeah. is her mind. Oh, beautiful. Because that was more what made her able to stand by a person who was yeah. being baptized and, you know, had all this going on. She yeah. was able to raise children. I mean, in yeah. one, one or two, imagine yeah. you're, you've been told that your daughter yeah. already is going to gender. It, so, so it's not just the money, the finance. Sure. So I think we've been a lot of, I've looking been looking at, at it for a very long time that way, but I saw that wasn't it. Yeah. Her greatest strength and wealth was her mind. So sure. it's really about us being intentional with what mm -hmm. we are creating mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day. so sure. um that will be our conversation for another day, inshallah nice. okay so yeah, this definitely. will be um the last question inshallah so if you were to encapsulate your your life's learnings up to this point in a few words of advice what will that be i can't <laughs> <laughs> no it's funny so we had we had this conversation with with, with a few siblings i was like you know how would you you know what what how would what kind of life advice would you all give and honestly, the answers were hysterical um, because you get these cookie cutter answers, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, you know, uh, don't judge a book by its cover. Um, what's the other one? Um, so, so you get a lot of that, but I, I can't, yeah. I don't, unfortunately, I just, I, know, I don't think I have an answer. I don't think I have any one singular thing. There are a few takeaways that I've taken from my father that I really love. And, and, and they, they, they're polar opposites because one is, he said, he always says to us, first, you must dare to dream. Because when you dream, you then have ideas. When you have ideas, you can put pen to paper and make those dreams become something into reality. At the same time, though, on the full opposite, he'll then say to you, if you want something, then you have to do it yourself. So that dream completely now kind of you hit rock bottom. You then have to kind of go and make it happen. But it tells you this issue of resilience. It, sends, it, it, it speaks to you being independent and making sure your dreams come alive because of yourself. And of course, inshallah, put God first and things hopefully will all fall into place. So I also really love that. But in all that I do, I think I like to just, I didn't plan to be where I am. When I finished university, I simply. Sure, go ahead. It's fine. Great. So I, I, I mentioned that, you know, my father, you know, his nuggets are always first, you must dare to dream. And then the second one is always um, whatever you want, don't do it yourself. It's the only way you can kind of ensure that that dream becomes a reality. So don't be too dependent on other people. Self-resilience, self, -resilient, self um, um, 
uh, self-awareness is really important to him and those are kind of traits I've taken along as well. For me, I didn't plan on, on being here. I didn't plan to get to where I am. I didn't wake up and say, I'm going to be a CEO. I'm going to lead a company of 300 people. What I did do after university was really just say, Allah, look, whatever comes my way, whatever I am, whatever you're going to put in me, whatever job I get, I am going to be the best at it. I'm going to be the absolute best. I'm going to be the most efficient, the most effective. And Alhamdulillah, what then started happening is I started getting noticed and progression started coming and it just kind of led to more and more progression. And then here we are. So my advice to people actually is going to be, my advice to people really is have a goal. Put prayer in front of that goal and be single-minded about it. Nothing, unfortunately, comes easy, but my goodness, it is worth having at the end of the day. There is nothing that you achieve that you say, subhanAllah, I wish I didn't do that. No achievement is ever one of regret, so I think it's that. I also think it's important to not live a life of regret. Whatever mistakes you've made, Allah SWT himself has said to you, he will forgive forgive everything about that, apart from that one thing. So when, when you have that in your mind, I'm not saying obviously go and be indiscriminate, but whatever regrets and mistakes you've made, please wake up the next day, make plans for that next day, wake up, realize that you are built for greatness. Like I've already mentioned, the Bible has a purpose. You as a complicated human being, you have purpose. You are meant to be here. There is a plan in place for you and you should be ready to embrace all those goals and all that greatness, inshallah. Yeah. Oh, my internet's really unstable. So sorry. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure if you caught some of it. Yeah, 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 I did. I did. I did catch that. Thank you so, so much for honoring us with mm-hmm. this conversation. I'm sure loads of people are going to benefit from it. And I really appreciate it for coming on here. Jazaki Lal, Hiren. So this has basically brought us to the end of this beautiful, beautiful conversation. Jazaki Lal, Hiren. So, if you're listening to this, I'm sure you've got a whole lot from it. So, bye bye. So, inshallah, till we come, another one. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.